Chapter 4 The next day the ghost was very weak and tired. The terrible excitement of the last four weeks was beginning to have its effect. His nerves were completely shattered, and he started at the slightest noise. For five days he kept his room, and at last made up his mind to give up the point of the blood stain on the library floor. If the Otis family did not want it, they clearly did not deserve it. They were evidently people on a low, material plane of existence, and quite incapable of appreciating the symbolic value of sensuous phenomena. The question of phantasmic apparitions and the development of astral bodies was of course quite a different matter, and really not under his control. It was his solemn duty to appear in the corridor once a week, and to gibber from the large oriel window on the first and third Wednesdays in every month. <laughs> and he did not see how he could honourably escape from his obligations. It is quite true that his life had been very evil, but, upon the other hand, he was most conscientious in all things connected with the supernatural. For the next three Saturdays, accordingly, he traversed the corridor as usual between midnight and three o'clock, taking every possible precaution against being either heard or seen. He removed his boots, trod as lightly as possible on the old worm-eaten boards, wore a large black velvet cloak, and was careful to use the rising sun lubricator for oiling his chains. I am bound to acknowledge that it was with a good deal of difficulty that he brought himself to adopt this last mode of protection. However, one night, while the family were at dinner, he slipped into Mr. Otis's bedroom and carried off the bottle. He felt a little humiliated at first, but afterwards was sensible enough to see that there was a great deal to be said for the invention, and to a certain degree it served his purpose. Still, in spite of everything, he was not left unmolested. Strings were continually being stretched across the corridor, over which he tripped in the dark, and on one occasion, while dressed for the part of Black Isaac, or the Huntsman of Hogley Woods, he met with a severe fall, through treading on a butter-slide which the twins had constructed from the entrance of the tapestry chamber to the top of the oak staircase. <laughs> this last insult so enraged him that he resolved to make one final effort to assert his dignity and social position, and determined to visit the insolent young Etonians the next night in his celebrated character of Reckless Rupert, or the Headless Earl. He had not appeared in this disguise for more than seventy years. In fact, not since he had so frightened pretty Lady Barbara Modish by means of it, that she suddenly broke off her engagement with the present Lord Canterville's grandfather, and ran away to Gretna Green with handsome Jack Castletown, declaring that nothing in the world would induce her to marry into a family that allowed such a horrible phantom to walk up and down the terrace at twilight. Poor Jack was afterwards shot in a duel by Lord Canterville on Wandsworth Common, and Lady Barbara died of a broken heart at Tunbridge Wells before the year was out. So, in every way, it had been a great success. It was, however, an extremely difficult make-up, if I may use such a theatrical expression in connection with one of the greatest mysteries of the supernatural, or, to employ a more scientific term, the higher natural world and it took him fully three hours to make his preparations. At last, everything was ready, and he was very pleased with his appearance. The big leather riding boots that went with the dress were just a little too large for him, and he could only find one of the two horse pistols, but on the whole he was quite satisfied. And at a quarter past one he glided out of the wainscoting and crept down the corridor. On reaching the room occupied by the twins, which I should mention was called the Blue Bedchamber, on account of the colour of its hangings, he found the door just ajar. Wishing to make an effective entrance, he flung it wide open, when a heavy jug of water fell right down on him, <laughs> wetting him to the skin, and just missing his left shoulder by a couple of inches. At the same moment, he heard stifled shrieks of laughter proceeding from the four-post bed. <laughs> The shock to his nervous system was so great that he fled back to his room as hard as he could go, and the next day he was laid up with a severe cold. <clears throat> the only thing that at all consoled him in the whole affair was the fact that he had not brought his head with him, for had he done so, the consequences might have been very serious. 
he now gave up all hope of ever frightening this rude American family, and contented himself, as a rule, with creeping about the passages in list slippers, with a thick red muffler around his throat for fear of draughts, and a small arquebuse in case he should be attacked by the twins. The final blow he received occurred on the 19th of September. He had gone downstairs to the great entrance hall, feeling sure that there, at any rate, he would be quite unmolested and was amusing himself by making satirical remarks on the large Saroni photographs of the United States minister and his wife, which had now taken the place of the Canterville family pictures. He was simply but neatly clad in a long shroud, spotted with churchyard mould, had tied up his jaw with a strip of yellow linen, and carried a small lantern and a sexton's spade. In fact, he was dressed for the character of Jonas the Graveless, or the corpse-snatcher of Chertsey Barn one of his most remarkable impersonations, and one which the Cantervilles had every reason to remember, as it was the real origin of their quarrel with their neighbour Lord Rufford. It was about a quarter past two o'clock in the morning, and as far as he could ascertain no one was stirring. As he was strolling towards the library, however, to see if there were any traces left of the blood-stain, suddenly there leaped out on him from a dark corner two figures, who waved their arms wildly above their heads and shrieked out, in his ear <laughs> seized with a panic which under the circumstances was only natural he rushed for the staircase but found washington otis waiting for him there with the big garden syringe and being thus hemmed in by his enemies on every side and driven almost to bay he vanished into the great iron stove which fortunately for him was not lit and had to make his way home through the flues and chimneys arriving at his own room in a terrible state of dirt disorder and despair after this he was not seen again on any nocturnal expedition the twins lay in wait for him on several occasions and strewed the passages with nutshells every night to the great annoyance of their parents and the servants but it was of no avail it was quite evident that his feelings were so wounded that he would not appear Mr. Otis consequently resumed his great work on the history of the Democratic Party, on which he had been engaged for some years. Mrs. Otis organized a wonderful clam-bake, which amazed the whole county. The boys took to lacrosse, euchre, poker, and other American national games, and Virginia rode about the lanes on her pony, accompanied by the young Duke of Cheshire, who had come to spend the last week of his holidays at Canterville Chase. It was generally assumed that the ghost had gone away and in fact mr otis wrote a letter to that effect to lord canterville who in reply expressed his great pleasure at the news and sent his best congratulations to the minister's worthy wife the otises however were deceived for the ghost was still in the house and though now almost an invalid was by no means ready to let matters rest particularly as he heard that among the guests was the young duke of cheshire whose grand-uncle lord francis stilton had once bet a hundred guineas with colonel carbury that he would play dice with the canterville ghost and was found the next morning lying on the floor of a card-room in such a helpless paralytic state that though he lived on to a great age he was never able to say anything again but double sixes the story was well known at the time, though, of course, out of respect to the feelings of the two noble families, every attempt was made to hush it up, and a full account of all the circumstances connected with it will be found in the third volume of Lord Tattle's Recollections of the Prince Regent and His Friends. The ghost, then, was naturally very anxious to show that he had not lost his influence over the Stiltons, with whom indeed he was distantly connected, his own first cousin having been married on second noce to the Sieur de Bulkeley from whom, as everyone knows, the Dukes of Cheshire are lineally descended. Accordingly, he made arrangements for appearing to Virginia's little lover in his celebrated impersonation of the Vampire Monk or the Bloodless Benedictine, a performance so horrible that when old Lady Startup saw it, which she did on one fatal New Year's Eve in the year 1764, she went off into the most piercing shrieks which culminated in violent apoplexy and died in three days after disinheriting the cantervilles who were her nearest relations and leaving all her money to her london apothecary at the last moment however his terror of the twins prevented his leaving his room and the little duke slept in peace under the great feathered canopy in the royal bedchamber 
and dreamed of Virginia. Mm.